we say there's two things you must know to create wealth. And I think that's something everyone's interested in. There's two things you must know if you want to improve the quality of your life. And we asked you know what they are. Well, it's pretty simple, really. You have to know where you are, and then you have to know where you're going. But you also have to get moving in that direction. Now, that is so basic, and it's so simple. It's so obvious. You'd wonder, how can so many people miss it? Why are so many people stuck? You just have to know where you are and where you're going. As a matter of fact, that is one of the best definitions of success that I've ever heard. We created a whole program, the Success Puzzle on it. Earl Nightingale was attempting to, to really get into the root meaning of success. And he started in 1934. He discovered it in 1951. And he said it was like a euphoric experience. He was driving his car and he had to pull over. That we become what we think about. He said success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And that's what we're talking about here. You know where you are and you're progressively moving in the direction of a predetermined target that you're going to shoot at. So you could say possibly that people are stuck because they have no goal. And that could be true. I don't think that's really the truth uh, for most people. It could be for some, but I don't think it is for everyone. See, I believe, like, I never really uh, knew much about setting goals until I was 26 years old when I started to really study Think and Grow Rich. And that's when it started to fall into place in my mind. But I would imagine before then I had goals. I just didn't determine them to be goals. I didn't ever, I had never written them out as on a card or, or really established. A goal to me was something that happened in a soccer game or in a hockey game. It was, you know, where a team picked up a point or something. But it wasn't a point in life that you worked toward. However, I think there were probably things that I wanted. So I did understand goals. I don't think that's where the problem is for most people. I think the problem for most people is right here where you are. Now, let me explain that this way. I met a man when I was 26, and he got me to really stop and take a look at myself. And he asked me if I thought he was a happy person. I said, yes, he seemed pretty happy to me. He said, have you ever seen me when I was sick? And I had to admit I hadn't. He said, have you ever seen me when I was broke? And again, I had to admit I hadn't. Well, he said, you've got to be one of the most miserable people that I have ever met. Now, he didn't mean that in an insulting manner. He was trying to shock me into taking a look at my life. And he said, you're always sick. Now, he said, you've always got some kind of a problem going on in your body. And he said, you're always broke. Then he asked me a question. He said, who are you? I said, what do you mean, who am I? I said, I'm Bob. I mean, I, I thought it was a dumb question. But I said, you're not Bob. He said, that's your name. He said that you're not your name, you have a name, and you've got two words that you call your name, your first and last name. But he said, that's not you, that's your name, and you can change your name if you want. I said, you probably won't, but you can. And so, you know, I got to think a moment, I'm not my name. And I pointed my body, I said, well, this is me. No, he said, that's your body, that's not you. He said, you've never heard anyone say am hand, or you never phone in, hear anybody phone into work and say body's not coming in today, it's sick. And that really got me thinking. He said, listen, if you have any problems, disturbances in your life, they're your problems. It's never anyone else. You can blame someone else if you want, but it's never anyone else. It's always yourself. And until you understand that, and correct that, you're not going to get to where you're going. Now, he said, you have the potential locked up within you to accomplish anything you want to accomplish. But he said, until you change your programming, it's not going to happen. Now, he said, you've got a basic problem, and the problem is your paradigm. And he said, a paradigm is something most people don't really know much about. A paradigm is 
a multitude of habits. But there are other people's habits, and it's important that you understand that. A paradigm is a multitude of habits, but there are other people's habits. They've been passed on from one generation to the next. All you have to do is take a look at the way you live, and you're going to see it's a reflection of the way your parents lived, your grandparents and your great-grandparents. Take a look at the food you eat. Most of the food you eat, you did not decide upon. You grew up liking it or disliking it. In fact, let's take a real look at what paradigms do. You see, paradigms literally shape your logic. Now, when you set goals or when you go to do something, you stay within the bounds of logic. I'll give you a good example. For a long time, people believed the world was flat. They did not believe that the world was round. In fact, they didn't even entertain the idea because it was so totally illogical. I mean, how would anyone live on the side of it? Forget the bottom. See, it only made sense that the world was, log was, was flat. That was logical. Well, some people had to go to the other side of logic. Now, they weren't very popular with their ideas. Everybody thought they were crazy. The Wright brothers had to go to the other side of logic. For centuries, it was believed anything heavier than air is going to fall to the earth, subtracted right to the center of the earth. You see, we couldn't get motorized objects in the air, especially to carry people or things. That was totally illogical. It was illogical that we could create an electric light bulb and illuminate the world. Anyone that's made a breakthrough all down through history, they've been very ordinary people that did very extraordinary things because they got on the other side of logic. They exercised their creative faculties. Now, I want you to think of this. Your paradigm controls your perception. I was in a seminar here just a while ago, and there was a colored chap sitting in the front row. Now, I say colored. We're all colored. He was a different color than me. And I went over and asked him. I said, if I asked the audience what color you are, they would say you're black. He smiled and he said, yeah. And they'd say, I'm white. But I said, the truth is, you're not black and I'm not white. If you ever saw a white person, you'd probably scream and run. Now, why do we say you're black and I'm white? Because that's what we see. You see, we don't see with our eyes. We see through our eyes. We see with cells of recognition in our brain. We've got a perception problem. Now, if we see something when we look at you or look at me that isn't there, how many other things do we see in our life that aren't there? How about all those obstacles that are stopping us from living the life we really want to live? You go back to the logic. The old saying is you've got to be realistic, you know. If you haven't got the money, you can't do that. You can do anything. And if you make up your mind to do it, you'll attract the money. Perception is a big problem. Now, our paradigms literally control how we utilize our time. Do you know that everyone gets exactly the same amount of time? They get all there is. The hobo sleeping on a park bench or the, the most progressive, productive industrialist in the world. Everybody gets exactly the same amount of time. So it's what we do with our time. Do you know that time can't be managed? The idea of managing time is absurd. You can only manage activity. And if you make up your mind you're going to be very active while you're awake, you're going to have a pretty good life. Your paradigm controls your effectiveness. It controls your productivity. See, at one time, I just wasn't a very effective person, so I wasn't very productive. I'm a very effective human being today, and I'm extremely productive. I get more done in an hour than I used to accomplish in a month in so far as providing service. Therefore, I can earn more money in an hour now than I used to in a month. Say, well, how does that happen? Well, your ability to earn money is always controlled by your paradigm. And as you become more effective, you're going to earn more money. Most people think we go to work to earn money. It's the worst way to earn money. Money is earned by providing service. I provide service while I am sleeping. I've recorded material. It's being used on the other side of the world from what I, where I am. So when I'm going to bed, people are getting up, and they're using my material, and I'm earning money for it. Now, if I can do that, you can do it. I never went to school. I only had a couple of months high school. I had no business experience. But I got an idea that I could do something, and then I started to act on that idea. You see, the truth is I bought into what Dr. J.B. Ryan 
was teaching at the time. He said, the mind is the greatest power in all of creation. Ryan was a professor at Duke University and a very well-read person on the non-physical side of life. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, to believe in the things you can see and touch is no belief at all. But to believe in the unseen is a triumph and a blessing. He was so on the ball. Well, Ryan was too. The mind is the greatest power in all all of creation. Now, we have been raised, um, I say we, I have, and I'm thinking you probably have too, in, a, in an environment where we recognize professionals like psychiatrists, psychologists, behavioral scientists, um, to know something about the mind, but um, not me, you see. Not the average person on the street, not a little child. The truth is a child can understand their mind and understand how it functions. And if they did, they would do so much better in school. Now play with this idea. You and I think in pictures. We literally think in pictures. Think of a feather. You see an image of a feather. Do you see that? We think in pictures. Okay, now think of this for a moment. What does your mind look like? What does your mind look like? Hmm. Odds are pretty good that you might see an image of the brain. But let's clearly understand this. The brain is not your mind any more than your fingernail is. You see, your fingernail and your brain are components, are part of a body, your body. Your body is the physical manifestation of an activity referred to as mind. Mind is movement. It's movement. Body is the manifestation of that movement. Now, if you're going to change your mind, you better understand something about your mind. You have to know what it looks like. And most people, when they start thinking of the mind, they become confused. And so rather than clear up the confusion, they turn on their television so they can get lost in somebody else's world. I want you to really think, my mind, what does it look like? Understand this. Out of confusion comes order. And it's a higher degree of order than that which existed prior to the confusion. When you start thinking about the mind, odds are pretty good you become very confused. Well, if you work at it, as I did, it took me nine years. I cleared up the confusion. You see, as a little kid, the teachers would say to me, Bob, why did you do that? I'd do something that I didn't want to do. It'd give me results I didn't want to get. My teachers were not too pleased with it. And they'd say, why did you do that? And I'd say, I don't know. They'd say, what do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Well, why'd you do it? I don't know. I'd go home. My mother would give me the same story. Why'd you do that? I don't know. Do you know better? I know. Why'd you? I don't know. When I was 17, I went in the Navy. Every commanding officer, Proctor, why'd you do that? I don't know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why'd you do it? I don't know. Well, we're going to teach you to know. And they'd have me out in the parade square running with a rifle over my head for a couple of weeks. Now, you would think that that would get me to change, but I didn't. And I'd go back and they'd say, why did you do that, Proctor? I don't know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. I want you to stop and think of things you do that you don't want to do. It's giving you results you don't want to get, and you do them anyway. You see, it's the paradigm. It's what's going on inside. The paradigm is like a program that has been registered and lodged in our subconscious mind. But just saying that doesn't do us any good. We talk about the paradigm, you know, controlling our perception, our effectiveness, our logic, our ability to earn money. Everyone knows how to earn more money, and most people need to earn more money to live a decent life. But they're not doing it. And it's not the fact they don't know they can. They know they can, but they're not. Well, let's look at this. Let you and I look at the mind and paradigms since the mind and paradigms is what it's all about. Now, I think it would probably be a good idea if we became more specific. Let's look at your mind 
and your paradigms. Now, I'm talking to you. I'm just talking to you, nobody else. I want you to listen carefully. Because if you can understand what I'm about to explain, and you will understand if I explain it properly, this could change your life like night and day. It certainly changed mine. I have had corporate executives all over the world, from Malaysia to Montreal, tell me that this has to be the most important lesson they've ever learned. Now, there was a doctor in San Antonio, Texas in 1934. He was appalled at the state of the healing arts. He said, we're not helping people get healthy at all. What we're doing is treating symptoms. We're treating the problem. We're not treating the cause of the problem. And whenever you treat the problem, it's going to reoccur because the cause of it has not been changed. Now, he said, we've got to treat the whole person, the whole person, not just the physical. You and I live simultaneously on three planes of understanding. And he said, we've got to start treating the mind. Nobody's ever seen the mind, so I'm going to draw a picture of the mind. And this is what he drew. This has to be the most phenomenal idea that you'll ever look at. There's a circle with the word mind in it, and a small circle with the word body in it. And the small circle is connected to the big circle. Here's what we want to know. The mind controls the body. Now, let's take the mind, and we'll divide it into two parts, the conscious and the subconscious mind. Now, are they different as night and day? Look it. The conscious mind is your thinking mind. And you know that you truly do become what you think about. He'd say, what if you don't think? Well, then you become what somebody else is thinking about. Because you're going to be the plaything for our forces that go on outside. And some people that hear this start to recognize, my goodness, that's what I am. I'm becoming what they think about. I'm becoming what they want me to become. I don't want to live that way. When you become subjective to somebody else's orders and desires, you're not living your life. You're living their life vicariously through you. Thinking is the highest function you and I are capable of. Do you know that every great leader that has ever lived has been quick to agree we become what we think about? They disagreed on virtually everything else, but that one point they're in agreement with. Do you know that this is called your educated mind? That's the part schools are very interested in dealing with, your conscious mind. This is also called the intellect. This is where the intellect is resident. Now, you see, the subconscious is the emotional mind. And it operates totally different from the conscious mind in this respect. Let's look at it. The conscious mind has the ability to choose. It can choose. The subconscious cannot choose. The conscious mind has the ability to accept or reject information. The subconscious doesn't have that ability. It does not have that ability. The conscious mind has the ability to originate information. Now, do you know, if you listen to this a hundred times, if you happen to get it to sink in, listen. Read it carefully. That is so important. You see, the subconscious mind must accept. When you say the conscious mind is the ability to accept or reject, subconscious doesn't have that ability. Subconscious has no ability to reject an information. Whatever is impressed upon it, it must accept. Now get this. It cannot differentiate between what's real and what's imagined. Now whatever goes into your subconscious mind affects your body. Your body is a molecular structure. Your body is just a mass of molecules and a high speed of vibration. The vibration of the body on a conscious level is referred to as feeling. When you say, I feel this way, I feel that way, what you're really saying, I'm consciously aware of the vibration I'm in. If I'm in a negative vibration, I'll say, I don't feel very good. I feel sick. I'm in a negative vibration. What's put me in a negative vibration? My mind. Is it my programming? Probably. Is it the acceptance of a bad idea? Probably. Could be fighting somebody else's thinking or way of life. See, we've got to consciously choose. We have the ability to originate. Now think. When you plant an idea in the subconscious mind, it controls your vibration. It controls the way you feel. And we say it cannot differentiate between what's real and what's imagined. Let's build a scenario here for a moment. 
a young man or a young lady, 17 years old, just got their driver's license, and you reluctantly lent them the car to go somewhere in the evening. All the time you're in the car, you're consciously choosing thoughts that are not necessarily the best. It's called worrying. And you start worrying, gosh, I wonder if she or he's okay. And they're supposed to be home at 10. It's 10.15, and they're not there. There's no sign of them. Now you start to really build a bad picture in your mind. 10.30, 11 o'clock comes. No sign of them. 11.30, you are in a panic state because you're starting to worry, you're building bad pictures, they're in an accident, you're thinking of falling in the hospital, and all this is being turned over your subconscious mind. It moves your body into a very negative vibration, and you are consciously upset. Meanwhile, the subject may be at a friend's house, and they were watching a movie and fell asleep on the sofa. Car's parked in the driveway. It's only a couple of blocks away. Car's perfectly safe. They're perfectly safe. But you see, you didn't know that. So you started to use your imagination. You built a terrible picture. Understand this. You can build a beautiful picture. You can build a picture in your mind of your future. You can see yourself six months, a year from now, living in a beautiful home of your choice, taking a beautiful vacation, driving the car you want, in the relationship you want. It's such a beautiful picture. And as you get emotionally involved, you feel so good. Yep, it'll go one way or another. Now, what do we do? Well, we do whatever we're programmed to do. Let's take a look at this drawing here. There's two stick persons. There's you today and you as an infant. Now, let's put the information to use that we've just gathered on this previous slide. Your mind is being inundated from the radio, from other people, from TV, from newspapers. It's coming into your conscious mind, and you have a reasoning factor there. Your, your reasoning factor gives you the ability to think, and you can think, that's terrible information. I don't want to get emotionally involved with that. So your subconscious is your emotional mind. I just don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to think bad thoughts. I'm not going to worry. Worry does nothing for us. It's like Dr. Mayo up at the clinic in, in, uh, in the United States, he said, I've never known a person to die from work, but many die from doubt. We've got the ability to say, get out of here. I'm not accepting that information. Remember, we have the ability to reject. We can choose whatever we want. Do you know during the Great Depression, not everyone went broke. Some people kept their thinking straight. They weren't afraid. They were creative. They were constructive. And they did very well. Why wouldn't we just say, get out of here? Well, for some strange reason, we don't. We let that idea go right into our subconscious mind. What idea? Whatever idea is coming our way. And you'd say, well, why would a person do that? Well... Let's stop and think. Let's set this one aside for a moment. Now let's look over when you were an infant. When you were an infant, oh, the conscious mind, if you didn't have one, we'll have to set it aside for a few minutes. Your subconscious was wide open. So whatever was going on around you was going right into your subconscious mind. If you had been taken out of a home in the suburbs of New York and put in a home in the suburbs of Beijing, you would learn fluent Chinese, although you might belong to a white Anglo-Saxon uh, American family. If you were taken out of a home in the suburbs of China and put in the home in New York, you'd grow up speaking English. The person from New York would grow up speaking Chinese, and the person from China would grow up speaking English. Even though their parents understood no English or the American parents understood no Chinese. Why? Because your subconscious mind is going to take whatever you offer to it. Whatever was going on around you when you were a child goes right into your subconscious mind. Was there a lot of talk of abundance and prosperity and conscious control over our own future and sit down and design our future and get emotionally involved and, and affirmations? Mm, not likely. But there was probably a lot of talk about lack and limitation came from the radio just to them, and then they repeat it. They repeat what they hear on the news, what they read in the newspaper. It goes in over and over and over again. And that's how 
you built an image of you. That's right. The suggestions that they give you. Why did you do that? How many times have you heard no when you're a little child? Probably 10,000. You'd say, Mommy, Daddy, I want to do this. How are you going to do that? Where's the money going? Do you think money grows on? See, you're saying trees just same as I did. Your self-image was formed. How you thought about you was formed by the environment that you were a part of. Now, this self-image was just one idea. The self-image turned into a paradigm. That's right. A paradigm, remember we said? is a multitude of ideas. Now, that's what happened when we were a kid. And if we go back and take a look at you today, that's the way we're wandering around today. Our mind wide open. Oh, do we think periodically, but not very often. I remember one time Earl Nightingale said, if most people said what they were thinking, they would be speechless. See, mental activity does not constitute thinking. And most people are just letting whatever's going on around them come in, and they repeat it. And they're letting that control them. They know they can't win. Here I am graduating from university in the high unemployment. I'll probably have a difficult time getting a job. Well, why do we think that way? Because we were programmed as little children. Now let's take a look on this slide. There's a big circle with the mind. There's the body. Let's divide the mind into two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. And this is where the sensory factors are. See them falling into place? You can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And look, they come like little antenna plugged in to the conscious mind. Now here's what we want to understand. Those sensory factors pick up information from outside. Now, we can use that to our benefit, or we can use it against us. I think Moses put it very well. I give you both a blessing and a curse. And you can look at your senses that way. Here's what we want to understand. They pick up everything that's going on around and feeds it in. And we have the ability there in our conscious mind to reject it, because that's where our intellectual mind is resonant. That's also the intellectual mind. Now, you have intellectual factors. And it's the intellectual factors that are going to change the paradigm that you see there in your subconscious. Let's take a look at the intellectual factors. There's perception, the will, imagination, memory, intuition, and reason. Now, they are mental faculties. There's a power flowing into your consciousness. You can think anything you want to think, anything you want to think. But you know what you're going to think? You're going to think ideas that are in harmony with the paradigm. Why? Well, remember what we said? It's what's going on in the subconscious that controls the vibration of the body. On a conscious level, vibration is known as feeling. That's right. But we can tell that paradigm to get out of town, and away it'll go. Do we do it? Well, not very often. And when you do, you change the vibration that the body's in. Now, Let's take a look at this learning model, okay? Let's take a look at the learning model, okay? Across the top, first you see the stick person. Now, the yellow is organized education model. The white is our model. It's life success model. So you hear with your ears, with your senses. You go to school. You hear what the teacher is saying. You gather the information. Now, gathering information is exactly what it implies. It's gathering information. It's the books being stored in the conscious mind. That's really what it is. And after a period of time, the teacher comes along, or the professor, and they give you a test. And when you answer the questions, they'll say you know or you don't know. And so that's how you find out how you get your education. Is that an education? Absolutely not. Gathering information is not learning. Look at, stroke that out, and let's take a look at the model here. This is what you're getting in the coaching. You listen carefully. Now, you listen with your emotions, not your ears. You've got to let yourself get emotionally involved in this information. Do not do this like school. Now, you're programmed to treat everything you learn, all the lessons like school. Don't do that. Just let yourself get emotionally involved. Treat this as something powerful. It will change everything in your life, from your relationships to the health of your body to your ability to earn money. Now, if you listen, odds are pretty good you'll learn. Let's take a look at what learning really is. 
See, we thought learning was listen to the teacher, remember it, and repeat it, and that's learning. That is not. Learning is when you consciously entertain an idea, you get emotionally involved in the idea, you step out and you act on the idea. You do it. You literally do it. It's acting on the idea, and you change the end result. Now, the learning is the feedback from the change in result. You think it works. That's learning. See, Vernon Howard says knowledge is the observation of a fact. Knowing is the inward experience of that fact. Beautiful, isn't it? Let's take a look at this. Here we are here, the subconscious mind. It has the paradigm, okay? Now, we've got here the conscious mind. There's a power flowing in. It's thought energy, and it gives us the ability to think, okay? Now, we can literally change our world through our thinking. We build images in our conscious mind. Now, let's do it again. We create the image, and we impress the image upon the subconscious mind. It controls the vibration we're in. This is so important. Now, when you impress an image upon the subconscious mind, the image dictates your vibration. Then whatever is in harmony with the vibration is attracted into your life. Now, ask yourself, what am I attracting into my life? Well, I'll tell you how to determine what you're attracting into your life. Your results will answer that question for you. That's right. What do you want to attract into your life? Not a good question? Our coaching program deals with wants. Notice the change in paradigm? That's what our coaching program does. Okay? It changes paradigms. Only if you do what we recommend. Like I always tell people, I can show you how to earn a million dollars if you do what I suggest. I've earned a million dollars many times. A year, sometimes in much less than a year. How does that happen? It happens through the proper use of this information. How about relationships? How about being uptight or relaxed? I'm going to tell you something. I'm a pretty relaxed guy. I really don't let too much get me uptight. I see all kinds of stuff going on around me, and people think I don't pay attention. I pretty well know what's going on around me. I just don't let it upset me. I know I can't change anybody else. I can only change me. And if I take control of me, I'm going to win. Now, I want you to look at this slide. Why repetition is necessary when changing paradigms. The white line that you see here represents the sound of a CD playing. Now, the red line represents you listening to your CD that's playing, okay? The white line represents the sound of a CD playing. Now remember, when you put the CD on, it just keeps playing. You don't stop and start it at every word. It just keeps going. The red line represents you listening to the sound, and all of a sudden, just like what's happened on listening to me, an idea hits your mind, and zingo, away you go, onto a different frequency. See, the sound is on the frequency that it's playing, but you're not on that frequency. You were, you were listening, and bingo, you talk off on a thought frequency. You still hear the CD playing, but you're not thinking about it anymore. You're up on the line, the yellow line represents you thinking about an idea, and you're not listening to what's going on. If somebody had asked you, what did he just say? You don't know. You heard it, but you weren't listening. See, you were thinking about the idea that hit your mind. Then you come back, come back down and you start listening. And then bang, another idea hits and off you go on a thought trap. See how that works? And then you come back down and you start listening and bang, another idea hits and away you go on a thought trap. Do you know that I drove around with a battery-operated record player, a long playing record, 
if you're fairly young, you probably never saw a long play record. But I drove around with a battery-operated record player with a needle on the record, playing the same record over and over and over again. I didn't know why I was doing it. I just, I loved listening to it. And what I heard in that record was the exact opposite to what I heard at home, what I heard from everybody around me, what I heard from the people I was working with. And you know, the record was telling me, listen to what they're talking about. Ask yourself, if you were talking about that with them, is it going to improve your quality of your life? And it caused the record caused me to start paying attention to what the record was saying and stop paying attention to what the people were saying. And you know what happened? Something beautiful started to happen. Do you remember how we talked about in your little life how you were programmed by what's going on around you? Well, I was reprogrammed with the record. I was literally reprogrammed. I reprogrammed my mind. Voila. It took me nine years to figure that out. My income went from 4,000 to over a million. I had no idea what was happening. I had no formal business education. I or, you know, or no formal business experience. No formal education. I had two months high school. I started cleaning floors. I started cleaning one office. I was doing it on the side to earn some extra money. I ended up cleaning floors in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, and London, England. My head was spinning. I couldn't tell you what was happening. I couldn't relate all this success to the fact I was listening to this guy talk on a record, but that's what was happening. You see, what he was talking about became my new paradigm, and your paradigm controls your actions but it controls much more than that. It controls what you attract. Look at this for a moment. Your conscious mind, this last line, is probably the most important. Is where your intellect is resident, okay? Your subconscious is where your paradigm is resident. Now in The Secret, we talked a lot about the law of attraction. But you know something? You don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. The law of attraction responds to your paradigm. What do we have to do? We have to learn how to change the paradigm. You see, I started to attract all kinds of good things. I attracted people that helped me. I attracted people that wanted to help me learn. I attracted business. I attracted more money. I attracted all kinds of beautiful things into my life, and I didn't know why. I didn't even relate it to his attraction. I thought it was lucky. Voltaire said we invented the word luck to express the known effects on unknown causes. He was right. Do you want to become lucky? Change your paradigm. 